and welcome to Catacrypt TV. My name is Jason J. Rock Houston, and we got two members of the Rod with us. The Rods, or rather, we got the legendary uh, Rods drummer uh, Carl Kennedy, who I've interviewed many times over here. And why don't you? Uh, can you interview? Um, excuse me. Can you introduce yourself, Freddie? Let us uh, let everybody know who you are. Yeah, Freddie Villano, and, the and new bass are, player. And uh, <laughs> let's start off talking to you, Freddie, because before Carl came on, you were sharing with me that. Um, the joke is that you joined right before you joined the band right before the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, so we were off to a you know resounding start of doing nothing. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, so I mean, I I came to the band through knowing Carl. You know, we've we've done some gigs together, um, and I worked with Carl and Dave on Dave's uh, last solo record, which was a tribute to Ronnie James Dio. And I had known Gary. You know, just being a another bass player uh in the area um we had gotten to know each other and uh so my my big joke with him was you know thanks for retiring and and giving me your gig right before a pandemic when you yeah, know yeah. there's nothing mm -hmm. there's nothing to do um yeah, so, yeah, having, wow. having said that you know having said that we're in full gear now you know yeah, trying so, to make so, Carl, nice time how do you how do you think freddie has fit into the rod since he's joined the band i can't say enough about how great it is um Sonically, fantastic. He and I played together very well from day one. We fit like a glove. Yeah. And now that we're working on a new album and we work on the live material, it's been great to work with him because we work out parts together. And it's, you know, really for me, it's exactly like it was in the days when I worked with Craig Gruber. Oh, wow. um, and it has, hasn't been like that since those days. And, and I love it. And I've missed it all these years because Gary – as great a bass player as he is, Gary was re reluctant sometimes to work out little parts. Okay. He was much more of an um, improvisational bass player. So he wasn't really into locking himself into little parts. And Freddie and I do it, and it's really powerful. And he has such a low end and a bright bass sound at the same time that it just gives the band a new energy. So I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a fan. And of course, Carl, you know, you and David have been there since day one. You guys have been the two uh, constant members of the band. And so let me ask you, why did you think now was the right time to release this live album, um, Live at Rose Hall? I'm just getting over a cold. And you know how when you have a cold yeah, yeah. and you get it gets dry. And so you have to forgive me. I'm going to be drinking throughout. Sure. No problem. Um, no problem. We understand. The, the, um, I really wanted to focus on where we are now as a band. And so yeah. we played the one gig, but then I wanted to record Rose Hall and, and I wanted it for to be a live album, mm -hmm. but we, I never discussed it with the guys. I had it recorded. We had some video shot. And then once we got the tracks, I'm like, well, this sounds good. And we, and Nate Horton mixed it for us and did a great job. Yeah. And I thought it's a great statement of the band, the rods today, where we are, we're alive and well, and really kicking better than ever. So I wanted it out for that reason, if none other than to introduce all the Rods fans to Freddie, because Gary has big shoes to fit, like you yeah. have to fill, you know, and, and so it's not really a case of filling those shoes as much yeah. as it is. Here's the band now, and this is where we are, and we're, we're really happy with it. And let the fans decide, because, you know, I could talk about it all day, how yeah, much sure. better I feel the band is uh, live than it's been in a long time. And, uh, you know, all of that, but it comes down to the fans and the fans have just been nothing but uh, accepting and loving it. So, yeah. and but it was a good, album, it was, it was a good statement to release. You guys are on fire. You know, the live album, it, um, it feels like those classic albums back in the day. Um, it reminds me of like Kiss the Live One or, or uh, Live at Budokan or even <laughs> the Live in the sense that you, you put it on and you feel like, you feel like you're there. Right. That's what I love about it, too. It's a good point. I love that aspect of it. And so, Freddie, what, what was it like for you, not only being the newest member of the band, but first first thing you do with the band is a live album? I, I mean, I think it, you know. <laughs> well, luckily, Carl didn't tell me that my first gig was being recorded for a live <laughs> record. So I, I wasn't you know, I didn't have that uh, concern when I was on stage that yeah. night. Um, otherwise, you know, I might have overthought things. But um you know, in hindsight, it's kind of interesting, you know, because you think if I think about all of my favorite bands, um, you know, like Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath and, you know, like you're mentioning Live at Budokan and stuff like that, you know, they're just 
seminal live albums you know all of those bands have like some live album that really defines who they are you yeah. know at a certain point in time and so it's sort of like an important component i think for um the integrity of a band you know to say here here we are you know warts and all this this is this is it you know i mean and so um you know i think i can actually listen to it i have listened to it in the car um you know i wouldn't say objectively you know because yeah. there's always some subjectiveness to sure, it but sure. um i can enjoy it you know yeah. which is unusual <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, usually as the performer you're picking it apart you know so. yeah you know and, and cheap trick live at bootcom that's one of the greatest light arms i bring that up too because um i don't know if a lot of people are aware of this but if you go and you listen to the original version of um that song i want you to want me it almost mm -hmm. sounds like i'm talking about the studio version now almost sounds like a swampy country song but they did that on that live album it, it gave that song a totally new life life it, it sounded mm -hmm. almost like a completely different song the live version yeah. yeah, that's a great album. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I think, too, it's cool, Freddie, uh, this being your first thing you do with the band, because um, people get to, you know, buy the live album. They can hear um, not not just what Freddie, the ba new bass player, does, but what the whole band sounds like live. And so it's kind of a, a great testament. Um, and your first gig with the band, how cool is that? You know, in retrospect, <laughs> yeah. you're like, OK, wow. So this is this guy's first show. This is the first thing he's done with the band. Man, uh, again, when I listen to it, it sounds like the band is on fire. It, it almost be like after listening to this live, um, I want to go see the Rods in concert when they come to my town. That's great to uh, hear. Well, that's you know, yeah, that's a good. Yeah. And the the warts and all. I mean, I made more mistakes in that show than Freddie did. <laughs> it was Freddie's <laughs> Freddie's first full gig. Yeah. So, and I, and listen, I'm proud of every mistake. I mean, it, it, as you say, warts and all, Carl. But but that's a good thing to me because. Um, very much like if you ever seen Deep Purple and Concert back in the day, they were they were like always a great jam band. I mean, they would be jamming on a song for like thirty minutes. My point being, um, if you want to if you want to go home and and spin the record, you, you can do that. But if you want to go see a band in concert, you know, like that, and it's gonna be they're gonna get the ultimate concert experience. It's gonna be much more than just listening to it on your on your record player. You know, mm -hmm. you get a much different experience. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that live experience is cool. When I listen to things, I'm I really live. I'd rather see somebody like getting back to the microphone and then the vocal comes in. Yeah, I'd rather see that than everything so perfect and spot on where you're thinking to yourself, are they using tracks? Like, I never yeah. want to think that at a live concert. And I know that I've seen concerts. Sure. And I know there's a, there are two big major bands that uh, their managers have told me. And like, the one comment was when I said, it seemed like, like what was going on? And he goes, I would be ashamed to tell you how much tracked music there is. And, you know, I'd rather hear bands just having a bad night than I would hear somebody, you know, playing to tracks. I mean, a big part of that is just even how technology has changed. I mean, talking about some of these classic albums that came out in these live albums came out in the 70s and that part of it was because they didn't even have the technology they have today. And, you know, even the vocals had to kind of, and some of these albums had to be touched up because they were banging around the microphones and stuff and they had to go back and kind of fix that stuff up. So just the yeah. technology has changed so much in the last several years. I remember when I was a kid and I can't think of what album it is, but um, I'm listening to it and I didn't understand that, you know, going back in and touching it up at the time because yeah. I was really young, but I remember thinking, he sang that, but then wait, there's this be saying it. How could he sing it twice? Yeah, like yeah. in the live album, you know, yeah. really <laughs> like what was that magic? Yeah, and so, um, Freddie, before we went on the air today, you were sharing with me, um, we never really got into the whole story, but you're sharing with me that, um, I was asking you, you know, Freddie, um, how big of a fan were you of the Rods before you joined the band, or did you become more of a fan once you joined? And you shared with me actually that they were one of the first bands you saw in concert. Could you share that with us? Yeah, sure. They uh, so the you know I mean I'd seen friends bands play in clubs and yeah, stuff. Yeah. I, you know I was young. My sisters, my siblings are a little older than me. So one of my sisters' boyfriends took me to my first real concert, which was um, Iron Maiden. It was at the North Stage Theater on Long Island. Mm -hmm. You know, a little place in Glen Cove, like one of those old school theaters. And um, you know, like Iron Maiden hadn't really totally blown up yet. It was on the Number of the Beast tour. And the Rods were the opening act, you know, and I, I didn't know who they were until I saw them. But, you know, I tell everybody that 
you know, even though, you know, I went on to become a huge Iron Maiden fan and, you know, Steve Harris is a big influence. The indelible imprint of that night for me is the rods, not iron. I remember more about the rods from that night than I do Iron Maiden. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it, uh, they left an impression, you know, that stayed with me and it's just weird cosmic stuff that I end up in the band. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, point. it's almost like you've come full <laughs> circle. You, you go yeah. from being a fan, mm-hmm. seeing the, this band play on stage, and years later, you're you're part of the band and you're up on stage with these guys playing these songs. Yeah, that's why I sometimes wear a Rod shirt on stage because Have I say, well, <laughs> I, was, I, w- I was a fan that just ended up on stage. <laughs> and so Carl, he brings up the fact that you um, toured with Iron Maiden. I got to ask, what do you remember from that tour? Because I, I imagine... Everybody in the seats on that tour, your ears had to be bleeding. Iron Maiden and the Rods. What a killer double bill. It was a great tour. I mean, it was, uh, they were really good to us. Their thing was, we had toured with Priest and Priest crew had treated us like crap. Yeah. And we kind of vowed never to do that to anybody. They, yeah. they told us some horror stories about having to take their gear off the stage from the front. And they were just, they had, were really upset about that. And uh, I'm sure those are, that's long gone, but for those bands, but uh, they were unhappy and they vowed not to. So they treated us very, very well. And, uh, they, and they were great guys. It was awesome to hear them. A lot of times Clive was way up high as wow. a riser. Yeah. And I would go behind his kit and I would watch him and he'd look down and smile, you know, cause I'd be back there watching him. And, and that and had to be a real fun tour for the simple fact that's the first uh, tour, um, Bruce Dickinson did with Maiden, and so it's a new Iron Maiden. People are just seeing how that is working, and the rods have been around for a few few years. But I mean, what a double killer bill that must have been! It was actually a surprisingly compatible bill, and the crowd was really receptive to us. You know. Yeah. Now let me ask you, Carl, about the new live album. Um, I, I think it's cool that you kind of had the idea to do it, but you didn't tell the other guys. I mean, um, after that gig, I mean, was it one gig or was it a couple of gigs you recorded it? One gig. That's a whole, the one show at Rose Hall. That was it. And so um, when you, when you listen to tapes or whatever, um, after that show, how surprised were you? Yeah, this, this is the show we wanted to put out. Um, I was surprised and I wasn't surprised. I knew that we had rehearsed. So I knew that, um, you know, it would be okay. And uh, I, like I said, I was one who made the most mistakes and I, I had no concerns for Freddie because Freddie, when he learns it, he locks it in. It's yeah. he plays it the same way every time. So he's all over it. I wasn't concerned about him, but you know, you never know in a performance, things happen, strings break, amps blow up, you know, things happen with the crowd. You have to stop, but there's so many variables live, which is what makes it cool. But so, you know, I was really happy that we actually wound up with a recording that was really, really captured a moment in time. And that's what those live recordings are, like Rock in the Fillmore. Sure, sure. They're all like, yeah. you can just hear they're having fun. And and uh, and that's what this captured. And that's that was the biggest thrill for me, or the, you know, I was happiest about was, wow, this is an event that was actually captured in its entirety. And it's, you know, really, you know, something I, I want to share with the fans. I love that fact alone that, that um, you know, you recorded the whole show, nothing... Nothing had to be cut because, you know, you got only got 80 minutes to put on a CD or whatever. I love the fact that it's the whole show, the whole complete package. Right. And, and um, let's talk about, was there any reason you wanted it to be that show? I mean, does Rose does Rose Hall, um, does it mean anything special to the band? For me, it was the first show back, first full okay. show back. And I loved, yeah. I loved Rose Hall. It's The crew was fantastic. I can't say enough good about them. And uh, so the crew was great. It was a, a nice place to play. It was a great stage. And and so it just had a good vibe, you know? So it was, I thought it was a great place to record. And it turned so out that it, I was right. Yeah, so the songs of this new live CD, let me ask you, um, are those the songs you guys typically play or did you add anything special because you wanted to capture it? No, that's that was the set we were doing last year. That's now good. it's changed. it's changed a little bit. And we're adding more classic songs as we go. And, you know, uh, I've always been a fan of the Rods. And I got I to gotta ask you, Carl, because, again, like I said, you and David have been uh, doing it all these years. You're the two constant. Um, you could do you guys could do a lot like a lot of bands and say, you know what? Um, nobody's buying CDs anymore. We're not going to bother recording any new music. And I'm glad that you guys haven't fallen into that category because I 
I think um, every time you release a new album, it kicks ass. And I just um, tip my hat to bands that are still putting out new music. I, you know, thanks for saying that. I agree. I feel the same way. Um, I know Elton John called out Billy Joel about not writing songs anymore, doing an album. And I love that Elton John still does it. You know, yeah. Not making any money on doing an album, obviously, but he's made his money. And so is Billy Joel. And so have a lot of other bands like Kiss and Twisted Sister. And, you know, I would love to see them put out new material, but a lot of bands are, are afraid of that, you know, and because it, it won't be reviewed well and maybe they won't make as much money. But I, I, respect and, uh, and and give praise to those bands who are like hey we're doing it for the fans and that's my attitude we're recording for the fans and for ourselves and there's no money in it anymore the way it used to be and uh, so it doesn't matter just I mean, I mean, for years, the fans have been able to kind of go out there on tour you know the big established bands at least and kind of still make a living that way but i was very surprised i recently read an article roger uh, daltrey of a who put out Talk about the fact that even the Who, he's like, you know, we're getting ready to wrap up our career anyway. But if we ever do any more live shows, it's probably just going to be in, be in Europe or England because even the Who, it costs major money to take their show on the road now. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's just, I'm not crying. You see, I don't, I don't have a tear. No, but, I got you, but, but yeah, but I but, I, but I get it. You know, it's it's expensive now to be out on the road. And, and so, uh, so, um, what, are you guys work? You're working on new music, so um. Might we get that next year, you think? I'm hoping by the end of this year or the first quarter of next year. And uh, we're in the process now. I mean, Freddie's rec been recording today. I started recording earlier and uh, hit a snag, oh. and uh, which was a heart attack for me. No big deal. I'll play it again. <laughs> but I went to do my drum track on a song that I cannot say, and we can't say okay. the song title, yeah. and we can't tell you the label we're signed to. I got you. But um, it's a big secret, but uh, the label will announce it soon enough. But I went to record. I had one little thing I wanted to fix. It was like done. I thought it was perfect. Yeah. There was one little thing, like one little snare hit. I thought, I'm going to go back and punch that in. And I went and opened my file, and there was nothing, and I can't oh, recover it. God. Wow. So now so now I have to re-record the entire thing, but that's okay. I'll probably do it. You know, it's probably hacked out anyway. I'll probably do it a little bit better. And, you know, Carl, but, uh, you're, a real, you're a real powerhouse drummer. I got to ask, you know, many um, many dr drummers as they get up there in age, I mean, you can look at somebody like Phil Collins and he's at the point, um, he's like in his mid 70s or something. He can't even play the drums. Thank God he's got that great voice. But um, how do you stay in yeah. such good shape where you're still able to play? Well, I drink heavily and I don't <laughs> sleep at all. And I go to <laughs> strip clubs every night. I and uh, stay stay out late and spend all no I I'm kidding I don't do any course, I don't do course. any of that yeah. I don't know that I don't know that uh, I mean I I work out a little bit every day you know I have my weights and things I do I try to watch my diet and yeah. uh, and I try to play drums as much as I can playing drums is a very athletic and sure. aerobic um, instrument so you know we sit there for an hour and uh, at home when I'm playing. I ask that I not be bothered once I start because I put a timer on and I'll watch a show. And my, yeah. my go, my go-to is to watch either a movie I'm really interested in or watching MMA. And when I'll practice, because those MMA fights are five minute rounds. Sure, sure. So I'll, I'll pick a rudiment or a fill, some type of single stroke, double stroke, whatever it is, paradiddle. I'll work on that at a higher tempo with my feet. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times I'm like, oh, I got to stop. Like, this is too hard. I can't. And then I look at, I'm looking at them going, they're kicking the shit out of each other. And I can probably get the next two minutes in just tapping on my drum pads and playing yeah. my, my pedals, you know? So it inspires me to keep building up that, you know, aerobicizing. So that's, that's it for me. And the fact that when I play my drums, I just have one way of playing like David, I always yeah. joke about David, you know, you give him an acoustic guitar and he's still too loud. Yeah. Wow. So for, 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 for me, for me, it's the same thing. Like I have, I have one approach to the drums and that's just yeah. loud. Like, like I would yeah. say, yeah. no one's ever asked me to, to, to uh, play harder. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's definitely true. And you know, um, <laughs> I, I think David is, although he does not get the credit, he is one of the ultimate um, front man in the sense that, I mean, think about what the guy does both on the guitar and, and vocally. I mean, the fact that he's the only guitar player in the band, there's not another he, he, he's he's the front man, and I think he does a great job at what he does. 
I do. I agree. I mean, I don't think he gets enough credit as the MC. I call him the right reverend. He's out yeah. preaching to the masses. I mean, he's great at it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think Barad's all together really don't get the credit. They just, you guys have um, been together so long and many people do consider you one of the legendary metal bands, but um, you're still out there doing it. I mean, you were never on the cover of um, all those, all those magazines back in the day, but yet you put out quality product for your fans. You're still out there touring. And, um, and, and the Rod is one of those bands, I guess, like uh, you're like the Energizer buddy, buddy, if you will, you, you guys just keep on going no matter what, nothing gets you down. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And it's true. And I think we've been true to ourselves all these years like we if you listen to the first album and you listen to brotherhood of metal or you listen to this new album that will be coming out named yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> you know that, that um i think you'll see that you know it's there's a bit of evolution lyrically and but but i think overall we're the same approach to the music we're not uh, trying to reinvent the wheel for the rods and yeah so you know you get you know what you're getting when you buy a rods product i mean the the thing i think and even in your last couple albums that is uh, quite uh obvious is it's just the progression of a rod you're not trying to recapture your glory days you're not trying to reinvent the wheel or or create a new sound for rod you're just um doing what you guys do right our focus is on writing the best songs we can write within the the constraints of what the rods are and uh, you know we always say this about the uh, the joke, but there's there's a little bit of a truth to it, which is the rods. We always say if it takes longer than five minutes to learn or has more than three chords in it, it's not a good rod song. And you know, so it's there's there is something something to be said for that because you have to work within the confines of what you are. And we're a live band, sure. And so if you start orchestrating parts and you don't have a keyboard player and you have lots of harmony guitar parts, well not going to work live for a band like ours ours is all about energy and about you know interacting with the crowd so try to stay with what you know what you do best and let me ask you guys both about being a three-piece band because um um, you look at the course of you know music history there's only been a handful of you know cream grand funk railroad um what do you enjoy the most about being a three-piece band versus a four or five-piece band well freddie you take this one i'll answer after yeah well i mean for for a bass player you know you're uh, the role of the bass completely changes. Uh-huh. Um, you know, if you're in a guitar, if you're in a band with one guitar player versus two guitar players or a guitar player and a keyboard player, um, you know, so there's a lot more sonic territory to cover in a three piece okay. band yeah. because, you know, you're not only part of the rhythm section, but you sort of have to fill in and guitar solos and whatnot. Yeah. So <laughs> it offers a lot of opportunity to get creative and um fill up that sonic territory uh you know in a band with two guitar players you know when one of the guitar players takes a solo the other guitar player is going to be playing rhythm so you can probably get away with playing a pretty conservative bass line but in a band like the rods you want to kind of you know uh, fill 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 it up a little bit but you don't want to go overboard either because you know the rods aren't at the same time the rods aren't rush you know so you have to find it find you know strike a balance between underplaying and overplaying and it's sure. it's a, it's an intriguing challenge you know yeah. i'm really shocked that you said we're not like rush like i've always heard <laughs> the rods and rush in the same sentence are very similar we should have opened for them um, <laughs> yeah wow you know but it probably felt like we would be like well, taking too much away from their whole too much stuff. pressure but, yeah they'd be mm-hmm. they'd be too threatened well maybe, maybe yeah. carl is the but fact for that- me yeah, in both bands, the drummer was so important, you know? <laughs> That's right. And the drummer was very important in Rush for some reason. But And in fact, I love Neil Peart. But anyway, my my thing is, I can sum it up in one word, freedom. Playing in a three-piece band for me is freedom. And the bands I started listening to when I was, I think I got my drums at 13. I had never, I wanted drums since I was four and a half, but I got them when I was 13. And then I started playing and... Uh, I was listening to all top 40 music, and uh, which was Hal Blaine. The majority of it was Hal Blaine, session drummer. I didn't know it was all the same guy. I thought these were all different drummers. Oh, listen to that guy. But <laughs> the music that, that really caught me was Blue Cheer on American oh, wow. Bandstand. Yeah. So that was the first band. Now, I'd been playing for whatever period of time. And uh, so now I was able to dial in a little bit. And suddenly I saw Blue Cheer in black and white 
on a portable TV in my house. And they were just, thing was summertime blues came on and just shaking the little speaker had it blasting, you know, going to blow up the speaker on the TV. And I thought, Oh, okay. That's cool. I like that. Yeah. And I went and bought another bass drum and I thought, wow. I had no idea what to do with it, but I bought it. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and then from there it went to, you know, progress to Hendrix and the who, of course. And, um, you know, Hendrix was a huge influence on me, Mitch Mitchell. Okay. And and those bands, and of course, Cream, Ginger mm-hmm. Baker. And so these three-piece bands were the, the bands that I really migrated to, like in terms of their jamming. And yeah. so that was it for me. But it's the freedom, the freedom to play, create things and in a normal the normal confines of a band, um, but that structure. Uh, you, yeah. you have to be a little more reserved, like Freddie was saying about, you know. You have to be a little bit safer or a little more locked into a strict part. I can ad lib a lot more than the band. I, I dig that. And you know, um, you bring up blue chair for um, a little bit of trivia for anybody who doesn't know this. Um, you mentioned summertime blues. That's actually a blue chair song, um, not originally a who song. <laughs> hmm That's right. And yeah. was it was it who was it? Wayne Cochran? Who was it? Eddie yeah, it's Cochran? not even it's not even a blue chair song. It's a oh, yeah. see, see? Yeah, oh, I, think, I think it was Wayne yeah, Cochran. Was I think you're right. Yeah. So, and for me, for me, as far as Blue Cheer goes, when I produced the Beast is Back for them, yeah. that was that was a huge, huge honor for me, and it was oh, wow. I was really happy to be become friends with them, and uh, you know they they were a band that boy went a storied band of everything you can do wrong in a career and get <laughs> it was like and and those guys and I and I hate to you know be mean or because no, no, no. I I love I love them but they they're like the Kama Sutra of the music business of how you can get screwed, like every position possible. That's what those guys went through. They got screwed every which way in the music business and they just ate them up. And it was a shame because they were really talented and a great band, but they, every, everything, every which way they got screwed. So So, so encyclopedia. Yeah. So many bands have that story, Carl, you know, and um, yes, we're one of them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, Unfortunately, you guys. Um, I don't. I, I don't think you guys ever lost the rights to your song, even like Freedom's Clearwater Revival. I mean, I mean, you hear all these awful right. stories, you know, guys feuding and hating one another. At least you're in a band where everybody gets along for the most part. Yeah, I don't. Actually, I don't like these guys. Um, you know, <laughs> so I mean, so I pretend. You know, I'm a good. Like, I probably could be a great actor, but I, you know, I pretend to like them. Yeah, it's been cool, a long, right? long, yeah. long haul for day. You know, I'm like I pretended 40 years to like the guy. It's like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, no. I mean, that's that's the big key. And right now, that's what I love the most is that Freddie is great. David and I joke around a lot. We have a lot of fun, and uh, Freddie fits right into that. Uh, and, and, and and you're right. I I was really happy that from day one, uh-huh. I made sure that we kept our rights for Sonic and uh, for sound and. Uh, for publishing so yeah. we were able to do reissues on high roller records and i don't know if you're aware of them but they've done a great great job on the color vinyl and you know heavy okay. grams and pressing so but yeah so we at least i i did do that for us one of the few things i've done that had any kind of brains to it and, and, and carl i gotta ask you um freddie was talking about the fact that he's a little bit younger than you and david what's that like to have a guy that's so much younger so you mean somebody who throws it in your face? Uh, like, like, no, but like, uh, I, I imagine you guys joke around with him. You play little pranks or tricks on him. No. Okay. Yeah, they make me we, carry their. They make me carry their luggage and um, <laughs> dr- drive the rental car. <laughs> drive the rental car. He did get stuck driving the rental car in Chicago. Oh, wow! Wow. But that's that's, cool. that's what that's always been with the rods. When we had the uh, golden calf, which was a big yeah. golden Cadillac or something, but you'd come out of a restaurant and the road crew would be with us. And so it would be five people in the car. And if you were the last one out, a lot of times the only seat available was the driver's seat. Wow. <laughs> so you're like, I'm not planning on driving, but well, if you want to sit in the car, you're going to drive. Yeah. You, you know, so, one thing's obvious in talking to both of you guys, um, there's a great sense of humor, a great um, chemistry in this band camaraderie. And I, I think um, that's why the Raj is still able to do what you guys do. Yeah, I agree because there are a lot of times when there are things that are unpleasant on the road, it's challenging. And at the level where we travel, it's not like we, you know, have like our own tour buses and we shut, you know, 
limousines to the airport for a private jet to take us back to home base. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's not like that. So sometimes it's travel is tough as we all know these days. So if you're not having fun hanging out with each other, then it's a problem because you're going to be hanging out with each other a lot. And, and let me ask you, Carl, you got all these bands, you know, Aerosmith and Kiss and all these other bands getting ready to, you know, announce their farewell and, and go on their one final tour. Um, do you ever see Dave Rod's announcing a farewell tour? Do you think you guys will just do it till you can't do it anymore? I think that's something that is inevitable. A catastrophic event yeah. could end it. Um, yeah. you never but know. I think at this point, I mean, we're, we're looking past this album to the next album. So there you go. Yeah. You know, that's just it one day at a time. And my, my daughter's husband, we were having dinner and my daughter was eating and her kind of her head down. And her husband said to me, so when do you think you'll stop doing this? And without missing a beat, my daughter said, never. <laughs> I mean, so, when you're not doing you know, a Raj, you're doing Kennedy or your other various projects or producing somebody. Uh, and that's the thing we should let people know, Carl, about you is um, you're very much more than just a drummer. You're involved in the producing and even the songwriting for the Raj. Um, it's not just all David writing everything, right? That's correct. And I have a new project. Uh, it's not called Kennedy, but it is the singer from Kennedy and John Hahn. And we have a bass player that uh, I don't mention as yet, but... Uh, so turning out to be a great, great project. Some great you songs. You were with another project a couple of years ago, maybe about a year and a half ago, called the 407s. Are you still involved in that? Yeah, the 450s. That's right. Yep, that's they're looking right. to do a new album. And so we're talking about heading to Miami and sometime in the winter and working on a second album. And I produced Adam and the Metal Hawks' um, okay. Christmas song, which was very, very well received. And it was a, it was really fun to work with them because they're very talented young people and uh, so and they've been supporting us on some shows and they're, they're going to be this wednesday at sharky's i don't know when yeah. this comes out so yeah. when will you release this but probably probably they, in the next next uh, week or so yeah okay so they were uh, they played sharky's with us because this will be in the past but sharky's yeah. uh, you know those guys are i've tried to get them on as many bills as i can with us because yeah. they're, they're a great addition a fantastic band it's great that you do that, Carl, you know, not just pumping your own career, but, um, give, you know, working with these younger bands that you produce and, and trying to get them on your shows. That That's cool. Yeah, well, I think that they deserve the exposure. I think Adam and the Metal Hawks will be a band people will be talking about. I mean, I think they're uh, they're really talented. Yeah, we'll have to check them out. And uh, before I let you guys go, let, let me ask you real quickly. Um, let's let people know how they get their hands on the new live album can they get physical copies or just available digitally or what did a reorder on the cd so they can okay they're on um, Bandcamp. they're on um, ebay and if you go to facebook you can just cms mgmt which is hard to remember but cms mgmt at aol.com paypal 15 dollars and five dollars shipping for us and we'll send you one Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Freddie. Nice uh, talking to you again, Carl. Uh, enjoy getting the chance yeah, to meet thank Freddie. You. We'll have you guys back another time. Take care. And um, I'll let um, the Lord of PR know when this goes up. I want to give him a huge shout out for setting this up. So thanks, you guys. Have a, Enjoy the rest of your day, okay? Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having have us. Have a great night. Anytime. You're always welcome back, you guys, okay? Thanks.